Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, the COP21 climate conference is underway in Paris uh, in light of that important event and to address some of the recent criticism of our industry. The CEOs of ASEA members' company today adopted a common statement which I would like to uh, share with you now. First, uh, we would like to reiterate our long-term commitment to reduce the environmental footprint of our vehicles as well as of manufacturing them. Uh, all of our member companies are addressing climate change and air quality concerns through a variety of strategies. For example, our industry has helped to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by developing more fuel efficient vehicles and by investing in alternative powertrains, including electric, hybrid, fuel cell, natural gas. As a result, last year the average new car emissions were 123 grams of CO2 per kilometer, down from 186 grams in 1995, this represents a decrease of 34% in less than two decades. The CO2 redu reductions have been achieved in combination with significant decreases in pollutant emissions, despite the fact that these initiatives sometimes require conflicting measures. Over the last 15 years, nitrogen oxide limits for diesel engines in cars have been reduced by 84%, and particulates by 90%. At the same time, we have succeeded in significantly reducing the environmental impact of vehicle manufacturing over the last decade. The overall CO2 emissions from car production dropped by more than 27% between 2005 and 2014. Thanks to the industry annual 40, 41.5 billion euros spent on innovation, we expect to continue improving the environmental performance of our vehicles and of manufacturing them. Next, I want to address the emission testing topic. As an industry, we fully support the need for improved emissions testing. For this reason, we have been working together on an updated laboratory test for measuring pollutant and CO2 emissions, which is called WLTP. In addition, we have been advocating for some time to establish an additional test to measure pollutant emissions under real driving conditions, known as RDE. The fact that driving in a laboratory test cycle is different from real-world driving is obviously well established. When the Euro 6 emissions limits were introduced in 2007, only the laboratory test was available. The purpose of the new RDE test is to bridge the gap between the current laboratory emissions test and the very different conditions experienced on the road. During a meeting of the European Commission Regulatory Committee and Member States in late October, the Member States voted to support a tough compromise text on RDE. The new testing standards would be difficult for automakers to reach in a short period. The industry urgently needs clarity so it can plan the development and design of vehicles in line with the new requirements. We also need the RDE test to restore the confidence of consumers and legislators in the environmental performance of our vehicle, our new vehicles. Finally, I would like to discuss the link between diesel and CO2 emissions. In recent years, EU policy has focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This has resulted in the world's most stringent CO2 targets for cars. Our industry success in reducing CO2 emissions has been largely dependent on higher sales of cars with diesel engines because they emit, as you know, some 15 to 20 percent less CO2 than comparable cars that run on petrol. Advanced diesel technology is a crucial component of manufacturer strategy to meet CO2 emission targets. Of course, the CO2 redu reduction strategies also include other important components, such investing further in alternative fuel vehicles. In the first three quarters of this year, 
nearly 416,000 alternative fuel vehicles were registered in the EU. That represents a 4% market share, up from 3.6% the previous year. So while market acceptance of alternative fuel vehicles is rising, they still represent a very small share of vehicle sales in Europe. To help increase the market share, ACEA is urging the swift expansion of the charging infrastructure, as well as the harmonization of customer incentives across EU member states. In the meantime, diesel remains essential for manufacturers to be able to achieve the CO2 targets for 2021 and beyond. In summary, <coughs> I would like to make three points. First, the European automotive industry will keep pushing the technical boundaries to find ever better ways of combining the benefits of diesel in terms of fuel economy and low CO2 emissions with continuously reduced pollutant emissions. This will also require a more coherent European policy framework in which ambitious climate change objectives are reconciled with tougher air quality standards. Second, ACEA will continue to contribute constructively to the ongoing process to update and strengthen testing requirements for exhaust pollutants and CO2 emissions. And finally, our industry is ready to work with policymakers to find the most effective and practical ways to further decarbonize road transport through a more comprehensive approach. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gohn. Just to follow up on uh, uh, the statement uh, made by Mr. Gohn, so uh, clearly emissions testing uh, has been, of course, high on the agenda, on your agenda, on your agenda, on the agenda of the policymakers, but also on our agenda. Um, we've seen this was quite some confusion in this discussion. Um, also some misperceptions or misrepresentations of the issues. So just in order to uh, make sure we help there, we have, I think you found that already in your press pack, uh, we try to provide an answer to the most common questions which have been raised on the subject. Uh, some of the things which, some of the allegations which were made, just to put it in context. Uh, but uh, again, up front you will find already on, on these questions uh, some answers from our industry in your press pack. I would like to, before we open it up for questions, uh, also say a few words about market developments. Uh, again, in your press pack there is uh, our latest uh, market and economic report uh, for the first three quarters of 2015. Um, just some key figures I want to highlight which you will find in this report. Um, when you look at the figures of production, um, for the first three quarters of the year, <coughs> the passenger car production in Europe increased by 6.8%, exceeding now 12 million units, uh, and that thanks to continued strength of demand in Europe. Uh, when you look at this uh, across markets, especially production in the EU increased in Italy, 61.2%. Uh, Spain, uh, where we saw production versus last year increasing with uh, about a bit more than 20%, and Poland almost 20%, so 19.7%. If you look at uh, where our industry is globally, uh, clearly you know, China continues to lead when it comes to production in our industry, uh, number one. Uh, so EU follows as the number two, and uh, the US as, uh, as number three. When you look at trade, trade figures, uh, you know our industry uh, produces more than it sells, so it's a big exporter. Uh, so if you look at the value of uh, EU imports and exports, uh, they increased over the first nine months of the year by 22.6% uh, when it comes to imports and 14% for exports, which resulted in a trade, a EU trade surplus. Uh, of uh, 72.8 billion euro euros, which is uh, more than 11% versus last year. If you look at it in more details, uh, where do we uh, mainly import from and export to from Europe? 
So the imports, and I'm not talking volume, but value, uh, the biggest import markets uh, for us, uh, so the countries from where we import or where manufacturers are importing are, in first instance, Japan. Number two is uh, US. Number three is Turkey. And uh, number four is South Korea. And when it comes to uh, export markets in value, so the countries to which we as manufacturers are exporting to from Europe, uh, the number one, and again, it's not volume but value, number one export market for us is the US, followed by China, and number three is Turkey. But what, what is interesting in this figures again, and it reconfirms what you already have said for a while, that is that uh, the US is our biggest trade partner when it comes to automotive, both when it is ex when you look at it export imports, which is obviously also one of the reasons why for us uh, the free trade uh, agreement discussions uh, between EU and US are so important. Then when you uh, look at the market as such, sales in Europe uh, in October 2015, so uh, last month, or two months ago, the, the passenger car market continued its uh, trend upwards uh, and marked the 26th consecutive month of growth. So the first 10 months of this year, new passenger car registrations increased 8.2% uh, versus last year, uh, now exceeding 11.5 million units. So that's a bit kind of the highlights from the report you have in your file, which I thought uh, was useful to add as well. So this kind of the official remarks, now we uh, open it up uh, for Q&As and Kara uh, will leave it. Okay, so just uh, a quick word before uh, we open the floor to questions. This is an ASEA press conference, so we take uh, your industry-wide questions, but we are not in a position to take company-specific questions. Uh, so if you just say your name and media outlet um, before each question. Let's go ahead. Tom Bellis from Journal. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, Volkswagen scandal. Um, has it affected how regulators are approaching um, the, the industry so far? Has it affected how they're um, thinking about environmental standards? Um, how they're approaching you on that? And the same question was, um, th th I think there's been some talk about a European type approval um, where uh, there's some kind of European level coordination of these national tests. What is what is your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, first of all, clearly, you know uh, what happened in Volkswagen okay, uh, has had ripple effects across the entire industry, the automotive industry. That's that's clear. Um, even if we need to make a differentiation between, you know, uh, the the real issue. Uh, which started the scandal at Volkswagen, which was the use of uh, uh, the software. And then the discussion which followed after that one, uh, in which the entire industry was involved and in, which was about um, the testing of uh, emissions. Okay. These are two different subjects. Uh, clearly, it has accelerated uh, progress on getting proposals forward on a new wheel <coughs> drive emissions test, as Mr. Gohn was saying, these discussions have uh, gone on already for some time to strengthen the way emission testing is done. Uh, in our opinion, too long. And we have from the start said that we are in favor as an industry, supported to the idea of upgrading, strengthening emission testing uh, and moving away from the tests which currently was in place was a completely outdated test. Uh, so it definitely has accelerated the discussion on this. Um, on type approval, and clearly the Commission was already planning to revise the type approval directive and we know that there was a new proposal in the pipeline. However, following uh, the recent developments which triggered questions about enforcement systems in member states. Um, the Commission is currently revising this type of approval directive uh, and is planning to come up, as far as we understand, with a new proposal and, and a further uh, upgraded proposal in the first quarter of next calendar year to address some of these issues. So enforcement and surveillance, that was or that's part of the type approval directive. And so they are uh, planning to look at, at it again in their new proposal. And is that a positive development that this would be coordinated in Europe? 
I think uh, we can only, you know, upload. Uh, I mean, each time issues uh, are coming up, we have also as industry an interest that those issues are addressed, that it's done in a transparent way, uh, and that it's ideally handled at a European level. Because that creates economies of scale. Yeah, and, and I would uh, add to the fact that obviously the trust of the consumer is paramount for car makers. So the fact, uh, as Eric mentioned, that there is a standardization of the testing and that uh, consumers see uh, a more uh, real driving uh, uh, experience testing homologated by the European community, determined, standardized at the level of the European community is extremely is extremely important because the last thing we want is to have a confusion at the level of the market and at the end of the day this confusion will create a lack of trust from consumers which obviously benefit nobody so we're very favorable to that. Um, I have a question from the back. Yes. Okay. Uh, to my German German radio, I have two questions, please. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one for Volkswagen too. I mean, what uh, Volkswagen uh, has proposed now to resolve the problem to, to call Carl Beck and uh, to add something uh, technical? Is, is this something uh, you are convinced of, or uh, do you don't have any option, uh, opinion on this? And the second question is on, uh, on trucks. There are no uh, <coughs> No um, standards for trucks for the time being, but the, the, the Americans and in Japan, I think also there there are now such uh, standards. Does this change anything for the European uh, truck industry, uh, or would you be in favor to develop this kind of standards in Europe too? <coughs> so on the Volkswagen question, we can't answer specifically on, on the company strategy, but yeah, yeah. Look, we know Volkswagen takes this and they have an interest <laughs> in serious, uh, and so it, it, it's up to Volkswagen to comment on what they are doing. It's not to, up to Marcel to, to, uh, to comment. Uh, on the trucks, uh, clearly, um, what we in the situation when it comes to driving CO2 emissions down, trucks and passenger cars is, is, is slightly different. Okay? First of all, uh, trucks come in different sizes and uh, uh, different combinations. Uh, what manufacturers are producing are cabins, and then of course, in function of the customer, there are trailers attached in, in all kind of form. So it's it's m you have it's a much more difficult uh, system uh, and reality you cope with than to come up with targets like in passenger cars. However, uh, you know, uh, fuel efficiency in the truck market, and, and we've seen the, the the results from that approach, has been especially driven by market forces in Europe, because at the end, fuel cost for the transporter is the biggest part of the transport cost, okay, which they charge to clients. So they have an interest in investing in a truck which is as fuel efficient as possible in order to reduce the cost of fuel consumption, which uh, makes it uh, more attractive to them. So um, we've seen that this market force driven approach has uh, led to more fuel efficient trucks coming into the market in Europe and we uh, in order to reconfirm that because uh, that is the news and the information which we received also from the different OEMs in order to get that confirmed last year we contracted out a study to transport and mobility Leuven which is an institute uh, with which with whom the Commission is often also working uh, to just check whether we are on track as uh, truck manufacturers to deliver 20% CO2 emission reduction by 2020 uh, um, or not. Okay, and, and so they confirmed through this third party re, uh, analysis and assessment, they confirmed we are on track to deliver. They see indeed further efficiencies coming to the market. In this report, there was also highlighted that we could even get more CO2 efficiencies or CO2 emission reductions and so fuel efficiencies if, like for passenger cars, we would go beyond the vehicle and look at an integrated approach. Uh, how can we work more closely with trailer manufacturers? How can we look at uh, other elements which affecting emissions like uh, eco-driving, like infrastructure and so on? Um, so again, we are confident that in Europe the system which is market-driven for trucks, okay, uh, works. You know, in order to uh, help 
uh, also customers of trucks to better understand uh, the, uh, this fuel efficiency that we are working on a certification system and so the focus uh, uh, for trucks is for the moment developing a certification system which would allow us to provide uh, comparable uh, emission information to the customers. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, I'll go here at the back first. Um, so uh, you say you've, you've uh, been aware that all the tests were coming in at some point. Um, I have you been working on those tests for uh, some time, or because when the the new um, um, factor of conformity were negotiated um, in the in the committee, in the committee um, it was argued that manufacturers needed more time, a couple of years, four years, two, two to four years, to, to work on the new technology. So is is this how? How far are you into this technology? Yeah, go ahead. Well, first of all, <coughs> none of the manufacturers can prepare on, on how to comply with a new test as long as the test isn't clear. Okay. And that is the reason why we said we welcome the fact that it's now a proposal, even if it's not a full-fledged proposal <coughs> yet. There are still details to, to be agreed. Okay. Um, so it's only, and that's why we are now, I mean, again, there is this compromise proposal. We, we know it's current in the parliament. It's, we are not yet there, so it still needs to be a, approved. So, but I, I think everybody it has now an interest that there is clarity on this, on the test as soon as possible. Then manufacturers know the context in which they can prepare the changes they need to make. Because the changes uh, may sometimes be substantial and require serious investments. So you don't just plan these investments without knowing mm -hmm. the context. Okay. Um, I think this lady here was waiting for a while. Zika Vetter from the German Business Week in Russia. Um, I was wondering whether you have tried to calculate the cost that you're going to incur as an industry due to the new um, RDE test, because you do have, I mean, Parliament still needs to approve, but you do have the figures now. And my second question is, Parliament uh, is most likely going to set up a committee to, to look further into a box um, uh, scan. Um, are, you, are you in favour of this? Uh, I mean, do you think this is going to, to add any new evidence or bring mm -hmm. something new to light into that? Or is it more of a political infighting thing of the Parliament? And how helpful is it for you as an industry? Will it be? Yeah, th there are many questions here. So let, let, let's say, uh, frankly, I, I think uh, uh, on the first element, as I mentioned, we we're first wait to see what's going to be the RDE decision. But for the moment, not decided yet because you it has. Figures. It could be permanent. Yeah, but it can still change. Rejected. Yeah, exactly. But it can, it, it can change. No, uh, it can't change it. Can't change no, no. That means the parliament can, can reject it. it then, can reject it. then if they reject it, then you're going to have a new proposal coming. So I, I, I don't think we spend too much time now into trying to give you an estimate about how much it's going to cost uh, the industry. Anyway, I don't have these figures. Maybe somebody has calculated the, the, these figures, and I don't think it's it's too reliable. I think no matter what, RDE has to be done uh, because we're all convinced that this is one way to re-establish. Uh, confidence and trust because the previous tests we had were so far from uh, the lab tests were so far from the reality that we, we nobody contests on the fact that RDE has to be done now what we want is RDE to be as post as much as possible near the concern of the consumer that's number one and second that uh, uh, they are feasible by the car manufacturer within a relatively uh, short uh, period uh, period of time. That's point number one. The second point is the initiative taken by the parliament relative to one company or to any other. That means obviously we cannot comment on that. We, we cannot uh, comment on that. What we want and we have always uh, said we would like is to have as much as possible clear rules and as much as possible uh, a time frame which is compatible with uh, the toughness of the rules. That means uh, if we want to do things in a logical and rational way, uh, we, uh, we're going to have to link the 
time frame with the with the rules uh, by themselves. We have been always advocating this. That's why we are always asking for some anticipation of what are going to be the rules in the future for us to make as much as possible rational decisions in terms of investments, in terms of selection of technology mm -hmm. to get uh, to, the, to, to the results. These are the things that I think are unanimous between all the OEMs uh, and are uh, really very present into dialogue uh, existing with the European, uh, with the European uh, Commission. Yeah, again, our in and uh, just want to reconfirm. Our industry has now interest in getting rather sooner than later clarity on this idea test yeah. to get it locked in rather sooner than later. That we know what the timing is. We need to respect because this affects, of course, the planning of all manufacturers. Yeah. Yeah. And and and, and you know we 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 we, we said that I mean, we 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 I think the larger investor in the European uh, Community with more than. 41 billion euro of investments on innovation and technologies. So, and we have plenty of solutions uh, in front of us. Uh, but the question is, uh, we can't afford to put solution on the market that the consumers cannot buy or they don't want to buy. Uh, when you look, uh, and, and that's why there must need a cooperation between the industry and the public sector, uh, uh, particularly the European community. So when we come with new technologies in order to meet whatever goal, well, that these solutions are acceptable for the consumer. Uh, uh, and, and it's not only a question of cost, because cost obviously is our own responsibility, but it can be also a question of infrastructure. Uh, we, we know very well that one of the limitations to the development of electric cars uh, in the uh, in, in Europe is a lack of charging infrastructure. Well, we, we know that we have been proved not only in Europe that we have proven it in the United States, in China, anywhere else. So somehow uh, we have a lot of technological solution, but uh, it's not a question only to decide what technology. We just need to make sure that the consumers are willing to buy it, because at the end of the day, if we get as we said, 3.5 percent or 4 percent of the market, which is made by extremely fuel efficient cars and the 96% are still uh, normal classical cars, uh, you know, we didn't advance too much. So what we want is find not only technical solution, but way to make them popular and acceptable by the consumer. And I mentioned, and it's not, it's not always only a cost issue, it al can be also a question of infrastructure, which should be behind this technology in order to make them more acceptable for the consumer. Thomas Friedrich, German paper for the Inhalten. Um, CEO, uh, CEO uh, of Volkswagen, Matthias Müller, just uh, uh, went uh, out of the board meeting. What did he declare and did he apologize for the behavior of the uh, German engineers? Second question would be, you mentioned that uh, in 2007, and no uh, other measurement uh, systems were available than on laboratory. Are you aware that already uh, beginning of 2000 so-called portable emission measuring systems were well established in, in the US and from 2007 on <coughs> joint research center in uh, the in-house capacity of, of uh, the European Commission and uh, the former commissioner uh, Tajani was well aware that there was a big uh, discrepancy between uh, the laboratory test uh, results and the real driving emissions. Are you aware of it or uh, was uh, the industry, which is, as you mentioned, uh, first exported to, uh, to the US, were not aware that in the US and even in the heart of, uh, of Europe and the Joint Research Center delivered already in 2007 the first report that there was a discrepancy. You were not aware of all this? Uh, obviously, we're not going to say that. Mean a board meeting is a board meeting. We cannot tell you what happened in a board meeting. It's a confidential. If you want us to know something, I think it's much better to ask the question to Mr. Muller. Yeah, I think it would be much more fair. He, he didn't to, respond to ask him to ask him to ask him question. Uh, you you understand in terms of ethics, we can't just course, tell you what but happened. The second question would be uh, what uh, happened. Uh, what happened on 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 the board? Now on the history of this, maybe I will let. Uh, uh, Secretary General of ISO, I'll tell you exactly what happened at the different uh, at the different steps. Uh, again, I think you need to start from the point that the testing we are talking about 
now is currently done not through pure improvisation, it's based on an existing regulation. So it is following regulatory requirements which were set indeed years ago. So in order to change that test, a new regulation is needed. And that's what we now talk about through this RDE. Okay. So these discussions, as we already said, on a new test have taken too long. Yes, why were these discussions taking place? Because everybody knew, not only industry, but also the policy makers at both national and European level, <coughs> that this lab test was outdated and that there were serious discrepancies between the outcome of that by law imposed lab test, I want to underline it, by law imposed lab test, and emissions in real driving conditions. We, that's why we are welcome, and in fact, the, the, responding to an earlier question, okay, because of now this, this the scandal which broke out, all of a sudden, you know, we got a proposal, okay? Um, and, and we welcome the fact that there is a proposal, and Again, from the industry side, we would like that this proposal is confirmed rather sooner than later so that we can move from an outdated test to a completely updated test, which will make use of PEMS. Um, you, you refer to the US. Uh, Europe will be the, the only market globally who starts using a real driving emission test. The US is not doing that. Uh, so, in that respect, the, the test which <coughs> we will have to comply with is more rigorous than the test uh, requirements which are currently uh, in place uh, in, in the US. So, you can confirm that the European automotive industry was and is aware that uh, real driving uh, emission measuring systems like the portable emission measuring uh, systems already exist for, for uh, long being. Uh, that is another question. I'm talking about uh, the, the, no, no, the, the PEMS test. Uh, you need to know that PEMS uh, has evolved as well. Yes, there was some type of test uh, available. Even today, one could argue that the test is not sufficiently, uh, you know, uh, mature. But at least it has evolved and progressed. You know? It's not that there was a test like that and that that as a static test is going to be reused today. The test, the PEMS test, which we are, or PEMS you are referring at, which we are going to implement now for passenger cars, is much more advanced than, you know, uh, when it was launched time ago, because it had a lot of inaccuracies and a lot of inefficiencies. And again, before you move to new tests, I mean, the current criticism is that we are not doing the right thing, so we want to make sure we do the right thing, and that, you know, it, it take, that takes some time as well. So we need to make sure that when we go for a new test, that it is reliable, also on PEMS. Okay, uh, yes, thank you, providers. Um, just a more general question, I and mean, what kind of impact have you seen on demand for different vehicles um, as a fallout of the VW scandal? And we can tell you that means that uh, so far there is nothing obvious uh, in the statistic coming from the market. Uh, obviously, it's too early, um, and uh, as you know, we are watching particularly retail. And let's not forget that retail is often the object of decisions and orders which have been taken a few weeks before or a couple of months before. So so the real impact, you're going to have to wait some months, uh, probably starting in January, February, that you're going to start to see. If there is any impact, you're going to start to see. But so far, neither at the level of the industry nor at the level of the individual OEM, uh, is there in Europe any obvious uh, change uh, into the pattern um, of buying uh, uh, linked to these uh, to these events. Okay, I'm not saying it will not happen, but I'm saying for the moment we didn't see it, and it's logical that we don't see it because again the cars we're selling today is, uh, in December are often cars which have been ordered uh, a few weeks uh, a few weeks ago. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, 
10年経つ共同入社アプリチーズのユーザーエージェンシーカーナクションの EU ジャパン FTA のソリューションズ。そう、その secret that the Japanese government's main objective for this negotiation is removal of tariff on automobile in Europe. And the commissioner amongst them said, so the EU is ready to, for the elimination of tariff on automobile in the EU if the uh, concession being returned from Japan will be sufficient. And she also said that the, the speed of uh, elimination on tariff uh, in the, by EU will depend on how fast and how, uh, how far and how fast Japan will uh, can solve the, the question of in, uh, non tariff non tariff barrier question. So, does it reflect clearly the position of the industry, and uh, what would be the reasonable speed and rates for the removal in the EU? Well, look, I mean, you accurately reflect. Uh, you know uh, the situation as it is today uh, you know the negotiations are moving forward quite constructively between both sides uh, yes it's true that uh, uh, while on the Japanese side there is a request for tariff elimination on our side uh, the request is elimination of non-tariff barriers um, there we've seen some progress uh, on the Japanese side but there's still more to come but again we are hopeful that things are going to move in the right direction. In terms of timing, uh, timings and transition periods, I think that's too early to make statements about that. Uh. I've seen that uh, West German radio from Cologne. Um, Mr. Gunn, you talked about how important it is to re-establish the confidence of consumers in the car industry, and it really is. Um, from your perspective, how helpful could the European Commission be to re-establish this confidence, given the fact that the former industry commissioner, Tajani, was informed in July 2012 exactly and detailed about the software manipulation <coughs> done by some parts of the car industry and didn't do anything, although a manager of the car industry informed him in a detailed manner and told him, please go to the public warn the car industry, do something. So, given this fact, how helpful can the European Commission be to re-establish the confidence? Uh, uh, frankly, that means you're referring to facts, I, I, I don't know, but uh, I'm not going to comment on that. No, what I'm saying is, you know, we as car makers, we have a reference. We need to have a reference, because we, we make different cars with different technologies with different approaches. You have the German makers, you have the French, you have the Italian, you have the imports, you have all the agents. And we have different approach to the technology. So somebody needs to give us a reference. And the somebody can be only the European community for Europe. That's the essence of the role of the European community. Tell us, this is the way you're gonna test cars. And these are exactly the objectives that you want you to reach. So that means, so for us, it's very important that the European Commission uh, takes its role and take position which from one side reassure the consumer, you bring the trust of the consumer, but at the, from the second side uh, are feasible. You know, as I told you, uh, that means obviously today if you take electric cars with zero emission, uh, they get every single, uh, you know, advantage you want, but except that consumers are not buying them or they're not buying them in a number sufficiently big in order to make a difference. So that's, I think, what we are requiring. We are requiring a single reference. It should be the European community because if every country or everything start to measure cars in a different way with different tests, confusion. There is complete confusion at the level of the consumer. We don't want that. We want the consumer we want the consumer to have one reference, and the only reference possible is the uh, European Commission. So that's why I think the role of the European Commission is very important, uh, to establish one rule for everybody. Obviously, this rule has to be uh, first reassuring for the consumer, but also this rule uh, should be, from the other side, feasible. 
uh, feasible in turn not only of technological know-how this no, I'm not so worried because there is so much innovation uh, coming uh, you know through the industry I'm not so worried about it but at the same time that it doesn't translate into very expensive cars that consumers reject we know it very well we all have to struggle in the cost of the new uh, uh, of the new uh, emissions and can't pass them to the consumer so, so we're, we're, we're stuck into a situation where we're putting the technology we're putting much much better cars but now when it comes to repass the cost of this technology well uh, we know that very well that the consumer is not accepting that so we need also to take in consideration this reality and for this we think the role of the European Commission is extremely important uh, knowing exactly what is the reality of innovation what is the reality of the market and then decide what is the reference because we all need the reference that, that's what I can tell you Plus, besides the predictability of regulation, also the coherence. Yeah. And we talked about, touched upon that in the statement, because what you've seen in, from a policy point of view across Europe, the focus has been on CO2. Okay, mm -hmm. Climate change is very important, and we don't dismiss it. It's very important. Also, COP21, we say it's very important to these discussions. But it's true that Europe is ahead of the game versus other regions in the world when it comes to setting CO2 emissions targets. Okay. We had in Europe a climate change uh, strategy which was very ambitious, which still wants to be ambitious. But then how do you make that coherent with air quality? Okay? In other regions of the world, there's more coherence between the standards they set between air quality and you know, climate change, and CO2 emissions. So the co there is coherence needed because what we do in one, I mean, you've seen it, uh, you know, all the focus on CO2 has led to a situation whereby across Europe, 17 of the 28 member states set up systems for years to encourage consumers to buy diesel because it was better for CO2. Mm. Now, the flip side of diesel is, of course, NOx. And then you get into air quality. But of course, by having given this signal to consumers, you also give a signal to industry who has invested heavily in diesel technology, because that's what consumers wanted. So if you now give a conflicting signal, uh, we need clarity. Yeah. And it needs to be not contradictory, but complementary. Yeah. And that is what we need, and that's where the U Europe can help. Yeah, I, and I, I think this is very important to understand that the decision made by the Commission condition the offer that's going to come to the market. That means the, only, that means the car makers in Europe are the same than in the United States. And they are the same in Japan. We have the same companies. Okay? Well, how come that in Europe diesel is 40% of 50% of the mix and it's less than 1% in the United States, less than 1% in Japan? Same companies. Well, well this is driven in a certain way by the legislator which obviously in a certain way give an orientation to the to, to the consumer and obviously we are here to serve the consumer so that's why I'm coming back to your point I think the decision of the European uh, uh, Commission are extremely important for the industry that's why we spend so much time dialoguing we have uh, ICOA spending time trying to explain the position of the industry and I can tell you it's not easy to have also a common position because you can understand that between the different <laughs> car makers and the mix of product that they do and the technology mm -hmm. it's a tough job for him to try to you know uh, align everybody on one on one position but because we know how important it is to try to speak as much as possible of one voice because the commission has to take a decision and if we start all to speak in a different with different voices it's going to be very difficult you know, and the last thing you want is introduce confusion in the mind of the consumer. This is the last thing you want. Mm. Okay, I'm the question I'm for COP uh, uh, 21. Can we take another question? Yeah, we can take one last question if you want. Yeah, we'll let you. Yeah. This lady was waiting for quite a while. To COP 21. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Uh, the question was for this lady who's been waiting for a long time. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Laurel Henning from MLEX. I just wanted to come back to the. Um, the compromise uh, that's in the Parliament at the moment, the agreement that was reached at the Technical Committee. Um, when that was first debated at committee level in the Parliament, it faced quite strong criticism from most parties, I would say, um, who were saying that um, the compromise uh, because of the timing that was going to be introduced for industry was almost retroactive on the standards that had, were agreed for in 2007 or, or whenever it was. So it was almost a... Um, 
a redrafting of legislation that had been agreed. That was their argument. I just wondered if you had any response to that heavy criticism that had come from the Parliament already <coughs> on that draft report and any, any threat that it could be thrown out by the Parliament. And obviously that would, that would lead to a delay in these discussions that you're saying. It's very important that this is agreed very quickly. Um, so what would be the impact of any delay on, on industry then again? Okay, in, in terms of the timings, the two, the, so the, the two steps which are part of the proposal, you know, a first step in 2017 and a second uh, uh, then in, in two, 2020, is something which is not new, was not added now, was already agreed by uh, member states some time ago. So, uh, again, and the timings which are suggested, which are tough, again, which are tough for the industry, the only reason why you have these timings is in order for planning purposes for industry to allow to move from where they are today, where the technology they invested in was only taking into account the test they had to comply with today. Uh, if there's tomorrow a new test which is much more stringent, it will require major changes, uh, not only uh, on the vehicle, but also on, on some of the platforms, so it may require re-engineering of engines, it may uh, you know, re require a different planning on the assembly lines. These things cannot be done overnight. Yeah? So, uh, and in terms of reaction to the discussion, yeah, okay, uh, we, we want to make sure we move forward as soon as possible. We need a proposal rather sooner than later. Imagine that the parliament would judge that they need to reject this, then we frankly going to be going back to square one. Okay. Because in the meantime, we need to comply with existing law. And the existing law imposes manufacturers to use a test, continues, uh, a test which continues to be an outdated test. 